Thank you, Frank. And as I said, he is our one of our bid protest gurus, arguably one of the best writers we have. So um, if you ever have any questions, please feel free. I will volunteer him to give you some uh, freebies on the phone, just at least in terms of timing, because time's critical and you don't want to miss that. Okay, so the last presentation, the thing standing between you and lunch, is uh, what is new and on the horizon? So this is really just an update of what have we seen in the last year. Um, haven't done this in the last few years, so uh, keep in mind you guys have critique sheets in front of you. On the phone, you're going to get a, a survey afterwards. Let us know what you like, let us know what you don't like, um, and uh, we do take that into account as we are thinking about next year's program. I'm going to talk about commercial item updates, as I said topic near and dear to my heart, uh, President Trump's Buy American Executive Order, Privacy Act training, security clearance requirements. I'm definitely seeing a lot more clients with security clearance questions and concerns, cybersecurity updates, Freedom of Information Act, gift giving restrictions. These are gift giving restrictions with respect to federal government employees and what they can and can't receive. It's important for you to know that as a company. What are you allowed to give federal government employees so you don't get in trouble? and then changes in employment-related requirements. So we're going to focus on, uh, for the commercial item update, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2017. There are several provisions that relate to commercial item contracts, and the first is in Section 871. And this requires Department of Defense procurement officials to conduct or obtain market research to support a price reasonableness determination for commercial items in a bid or offer submitted in a, to a solicitation. And I stood here and you go, well, wait a second, market research. Mm -hmm. That's typically what the government has to do before they issue the solicitation. So using it here in the context that market research to determine if a price and a proposal is fair and reasonable already doesn't make sense. Um, but they say that if you have major weapon systems, subsystems, components, they're already getting that information under 10 U.S.C. 2379D. This is the uh, part of the code where when major weapon systems and its subsystems components can qualify as commercial items. It already has a requirement to give information to demonstrate price reasonableness. But for all other commercial items, it says procurement officials may require the offeror to submit the information necessary for conducting market research. So um, under FAR 15.4, it's the obligation of the government to conduct a price analysis and determine if a price is fair and reasonable. And more and more, we see contract officers putting the onus on the contractor, saying, well, you are better positioned to tell me what prices you sell these goods, commercial goods, to commercial customers or other government customers. So you tell us those prices, and we'll tell you if what we're going to pay is fair and reasonable. And Well, that's not really where the government's supposed to start. They're supposed to start by some market research. Market research inherently is not just with the offeror. So uh, the other thing that this doesn't really address is what about adequate price competition? If you have adequate price competition, you shouldn't have to justify your price as fair and reasonable. That's the whole point of the competition. If your lowest price or best value is fair and reasonable. So I'm not quite sure how this is going to get implemented. Uh, the next is Section 872, uh, also relating to price reasonableness analysis. And again, this puts one other obligation on offerors, gives you the opportunity to submit information or analysis relating to the value of a commercial item. Now this actually might be help you, helpful, and I don't know if they've intentionally used the word value or not, but sometimes it doesn't just come down to price. I have clients who sell commercial items and it, you know, they have a price, and maybe they're the only one who really offers that commercial item, but they sell it to the government and to commercial marketplace, so it's still a commercial item, even if they're sole source. And they need to show that their price is fair and reasonable, and if the government looks at the cost and profit elements, the profit's going to be more than what the government's typically willing to pay. So maybe this value prospect would give a offer an opportunity to show that you this is a very valuable technology or, or whatever basis to hopefully uh, validate a higher profit. Next is Section 873. Uh, this also I think will be helpful for contractors. It requires the Department of Defense to maintain a centralized capability to provide assistance to defense agencies when they need to make commercial item determinations, conduct market research or analyze price reasonableness. The market research reference is a requirement that prior to issuing a solicitation, contracting officers are supposed to conduct market research to determine if there are commercial items out there that satisfy their needs. If so, they're supposed to issue a commercial item solicitation. It is better for contractors if the government is sharing this information across the agency because we often find times where you're selling one thing to one agency 
with the Department of Defense that's considered a commercial item, and then another agency issues you a non-commercial item solicitation. And then you have to go convince them. Um, for example, when it comes to advertising services, I see some solicitations that are issued as commercial item and some non-commercial item. Well, isn't really advertising advertising? Is, how is it different? So the agencies, even within the Department of Defense, are not consistent in this regard, and so this might help that. Also, as they start to compile commercial item determinations, that not only can help you across agencies, but also as um, a higher tiered contractor. More and more our subcontractors are telling their primes, hey, we're a commercial item contractor, these are commercial items. And they say, well, give me proof that the government has accepted your position that this is a commercial item. Or, or they ask the alternative, has the government ever denied the request for commercial item status? So having this kind of library of documents that potentially could be FOIA-able, could be requested through FOIA, would be helpful. Section 874 requires uh, revisions to the DFAR to provide a list of defense unique provisions that do not apply <clears throat> to commercial item prime contracts, subcontracts, and cost contracts. As Miha told you earlier, it used to be that the DFAR did have a list of slow down these specific clauses in commercial item subcontracts, but actually um, now it just says you only need to flow down those that say they have to be flowed down. So that means you gotta read every clause, both the primes and the subs, and that's onerous. So hopefully this will per at least provide a you do not need to flow down these clauses and give both primes and subs more visibility. We spend a lot of our days, and I know our clients spend a lot of money, trying to figure out what do they need to flow down, what do they need to accept. So I am all for enhanced transparency in this area. Section 875 requires the Department of Defense to use commercial or non-government specifications and standards for all acquisitions. If you are a company that has some specifications or standards that are not mil-spec, right? We have the government mil-spec and all their uh, unique standard specifications. They're lengthy, they're onerous, they're often conflicting with one another. Um, this says it encourages contractors to offer their commercial specifications and standards to the government. So it, you know, when you get back to your desk, meet with your engineering team and figure out, is there anything here that we want to actually propose to the government and inform uh, their next solicitation so that we don't, we're not stuck with all those old mill specs. Section 876 restricts agencies from entering into a non-commercial item contract in excess of 10 million for following services, which are listed here. Again, this is just serves to support the government's continued uh, emphasis that commercial item contracts should be the first thought as to whether or not something qualifies as a commercial item. Also in the commercial item realm, we have um, the GSA transactional data reporting rule, which we talked about last year, um, or maybe it was the year before, the pilot program began in June 2016. So for those of you who are not familiar with the GSA Multiple Award Schedule program, uh, it's basically a catalog that GSA runs. Other federal government agencies can order off of it. In order to get a contract, uh, GSA has to determine that your price is fair and reasonable. And then once you have a GSA contract, other agencies can order fairly easily off your schedule contract without having to comply with the fair and open competition rules. In order to get that contract, you have to provide a CSP, Commercial Sales Practice Disclosure, where you disclose to the government the prices at which you sell those goods commercially across the board. You can do it by category of customer, or type of customer, or by individual customer. But you have to disclose all discounts, rebates, any, any sort of pricing discrepancies. You then enter into negotiations with GSA as to what price goes on your schedule contract. They're, of course, going to want the lowest price. You're going to probably tell them they don't deserve to be classified as one of your um, the lowest price customers for X, Y, Z reasons. You have a negotiation and you agree on a price. You then also agree on a basis of award customer. So that is the customer category of customers on which your pricing is based. And throughout your contract, you have to maintain that same pricing relationship. If you give the basis of award customer a better discount, you got to extend the same better discount to the government, or, or just at least maintain a relationship. So. Commercial basis award customer has a 10% discount, and GSA gets a 5% discount. If you increase the commercial discount to 15%, you have to increase GSA to 10 So maintain the same relationship. If you give a commercial customer and your basis award customer a better price at any point during the contract, then you need to give the government that same better price. If you fail to do so for up to three years after contract performance, the government can conduct an audit 
and do a unilateral price reduction. And it's the retroactive back to when you gave that other contractor the better price or the other client. Um, this is all onerous. And for years, contractors, the government, they know that something's wrong here. So their proposal on how to fix it is this transactional data reporting role, which is to go to what I just described, which is a vertical pricing model within a company, how's your pricing, to a horizontal model. So across all contractors for the same or similar goods, what's the pricing? And so they do this by gathering transactional data. So what it requires is that for your contracts, you need to report 11 data elements under your GSA orders. Contract number, order number, non-federal entity, description of the deliverable, manufacturer name, part number, unit of measure, quantity, universal product code, price per unit, total price. So um, you have to gather all that and submit it for each um, order that you receive. This was started as a pilot program. It was limited to 30% of the schedule contracts and about 43% of the GSA schedule sales volume. It was optional to those schedule that were in the pilot. Um, if they currently had a contract, it was optional, but new uh, offerers trying to get contracts in those schedules, uh, they had to submit or they had to participate in this pilot program. And if a contractor had a contract up for the five-year renewal, um, they also had to participate. Um, there was, with the voluntary opt-in, over 1,000 contractors opted into the pilot. So the update here is that in August 2017, GSA made participation by new contractors to be voluntary as well because they've had enough opt-in. So by a show of hands in the room, anyone doing transactional data reporting on a schedule contract? And for those on the phone, we see no hands. So can't figure out how it's going. The next, we have Trump's uh, Buy American and Hire American Executive Order issued in April 2017. I have the language of the executive order here. Uh, basically, it is requiring um, executive branch to maximize, consistent with federal law through terms and conditions, the use of goods, products, and materials produced in the United States. For uh, produced in the United States means for iron and steel products, all manufacturing processes, from the initial melting stage to the application of coatings that had occur in the U.S. Um, this is not the same standard that we see under the Buy American Act or under the Trade Agreements Act. Um, so what does this really do? Well, rest assured, this doesn't change really anything that we're all used to, which is we have the Buy American Act, we have the Trade Agreements Act, we still have um, the authorized exemptions under the Buy American Act, and nothing has changed that. Buy American Act is a price preference statute. It doesn't mean that you cannot offer a non-U.S. product or, an, or, I guess I'd say, a foreign end product. It just means that you need to disclose that, and then the government is going to evaluate your, price dif your proposed price differently than it will a domestic product. Uh, trade Agreements Act is different. You cannot supply a non-conforming Trade Agreements Act product unless um, there's been a waiver of the requirement, an exception. But, um, so it really doesn't change that much. Well, what does it do? Um, well, first of all, what it really does is that it now it changes agencies' Section 3 reporting requirements, so they have to report on the training associated with Buy American Act, um, whatever marketing and outreach they're doing, and they have to summarize their compliance with Buy American Act requirements. So what this is doing is contracting officers who maybe weren't paying much attention to these requirements, it's now top of mind for them. We've talked about the False Claims Act, we talked about things that are material to the government's decisions to make a payment. This, even though you have your Express Buy American Act certifications, this also is going to be probably something that's more top of mind for agencies and something they can point to as material to their decision to render payments. Privacy Act training. If you are subject to the Privacy Act, so if you have a system or records that you have to maintain on behalf of an agency, typically you have personally identifiable information running through your system, then you need to comply with the Privacy Act and in January 2017, there was a new FAR clause that actually requires training, Privacy Act training, for employees who are handling that information. Um, there's some minimum requirements that the training must cover. You have to re uh, maintain records to ensure that you're tracking training, and this needs to be flowed down to subcontracts, including commercial item subcontracts, that similarly are subject to the Privacy Act. Training was always a good practice. Um, we have a lot of clients who are subject to both HIPAA and the Privacy Act, there is a lot of overlap. Some, there are a few nuances. And if you already are training annually on HIPAA, you can add a Privacy Act component to it without much uh, more effort. 
security clearance requirements. So these are only companies who have access to classified or uh, secret, top secret information. But there were changes in May of 2016 to the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual, otherwise known as the FINISPOM. And uh, it requires that by November 30th of 2016, there needed to be a written program in place, and it was a, an insider threat detection and avoidance program. Um, so it basically is going to require that there's um, a way to identify potential insider threats, detect it, and uh, try to plan so that you avoid insider threats as much as possible. Insider threat is the likelihood, risk, or potential an insider will use his or her authorized access wittingly or unwittingly to do harm to the security of the United States. Um, this really is focused on the folks who actually get access to classified information. Um, if you have an insider threat because someone who does not have a security clearance is accessing classified information, I think you have a different big problem. But uh, so it requires you to mitigate the risk of an insider threat and have this written program. Uh, the next slide also talks about some of the other things you need to have, including a senior company official as the insider threat program senior official. The new title, it could also be the same person as your facility security officer. You need to conduct and document annual self-inspections. Um, and here are the other requirements here. So I, I know this doesn't really apply to everybody, but it's something if you have not already implemented it, I'm sure DSS has already been on you, <laughs> on, on your case about it, but just wanted to point that out. Also relating to security clearance requirements in May of 2016, DSS issued a new guide in mitigating and managing affiliate operations. And these are just for entities that are bound by foreign ownership control or influence mitigation agreements. So if you have a company with a security clearance, especially if you're doing some mergers and acquisitions, if they are owned or controlled uh, by foreign companies or individuals, you have a concern where you have foreign ownership control or influence. And in order for you to maintain your security clearance, you need to give DSS certain reassurances that folks, who, the foreign owners, will not have access to classified information and are sufficiently insulated from certain parts of the business. There are different foci mitigation agreements you can have. You have SSA, uh, SCA, all these lovely acronyms. Uh, you could even potentially need to have a proxy board, but uh, just depending on the level of foreign involvement. Uh, but one of this new requirement is requiring contractors to submit an affiliated operations plan. And so if you have affiliates that do not have security clearances, then you need to get basically approval before you have common third parties that you use, whether they're accountants, whether they're um, lenders, uh, lawyers, for example. So if we are representing a parent company and a bunch of their subsidiaries, and one of the subsidiaries is cleared but not the others, they'd have to identify fully as part of the affiliated operations plan, again, to make sure that operations are sufficiently distinct. DSS has a template for this, but it does require a lot, of, a lot more procedures and compliance. Cybersecurity. Everyone has been asking about cybersecurity with a looming deadline. I have to admit, cybersecurity is not my forte. It is Frank's forte. So please talk to Frank about cybersecurity during the break. But so we have the FAR clause, 5224-21, basic safeguarding of covered information systems. Uh, this, this clause addresses federal contract information, it's information not intended for public release provided by or generated for the government under a contract uh, with the government, and uh, does not include information provided by the government to the public, such as information on public websites or simple transactional information, such as those necessary to process payments. A covered contractor information system means an information system that's owned or operated by a contractor that processes, stores, or submits this federal contract information. Uh, typically, compliance with this is not as onerous. Uh, you'll see a reference to the NIST standards here that are listed on the slide. Um, in order to comply with this clause, you're only subject to 15 standards relating to six of the 14 security control families in the NIST. The NIST is a very technical requirement. We typically don't get too involved in going through what your system is and whether or not you're compliant with various aspects of the NIST because it is technical, but this is where legal and IT need to make friends and try to speak the same language because this is really an IT requirement. And then there's the DFAR clause. This applies to defense contractors that process, store, transmit, cover defense information. Note that if you are a cloud computing service provider, you have a different clause that governs your cybersecurity obligations. 
Covered defense information is unclassified controlled technical information that's described in the CUI registry or other information that requires safeguarding or dissemination controls and is either marked or otherwise identified in the contract, task order, delivery order, um, and provided to the contractor by or on behalf of DOD in support of performance of the contract, or collected, developed, received, transmitted, stored, or used uh, by or on behalf of the contractor in support of performance of the contract. Note, it doesn't require marking. So it's marking or um, as otherwise identified in the CUI registry or as identified in the contract. So it's not always something that's going to jump out to you. However, if you have ITAR information, pretty much you're covered. So that's a safe bet. This requires compliance with more than 100 security requirements specified in the 14 family of security controls in the NIST standard. And there was a requirement to be compliant by December 31st of 2017. And contractors are still struggling, even though they know this is on the horizon, it's been looming for a little bit of time now, I think they're still struggling as to, ah, what happens if we don't hit that? In June 2017, there's a DOD industry day to uh, talk about this new rule, and here are some of the key takeaways. The first is the key to compliance with the contract clause isn't necessarily to have in place a system that meets all 100 of these security requirements. It's to have a system security plan and plan of action and milestones that accurately reflects the status of your compliance. So if you do not yet have compliance with certain of these attributes, and requirements, but you know you will and you have a plan to get compliant, that's what you need to put in your system security plan and plan of action and milestones as to when you're going to be compliant. And if you have that and it's accurate and you're addressing all of the current discrepancies between your current system and the NIST, then you're compliant with the contract clause. Um, the SSP needs to describe the boundary of your information system, the operational environment for the system, how security requirements are implemented, and the relationships or connections with other systems. Uh, DCMA audits are going to focus on verifying that you have an SSP, verifying that you've submitted within 30 days of any contract award through October 2017, a list or notification of requirements that you've not yet compliant with, and is also to verify that you possess an approved external certificate authority issued medium assurance public key infrastructure certificate. Mouthful. Okay, so where there might be gaps between the NIST standards and your current system, address them in the SSP. When you're trying to figure out what is CDI, obviously marking, if it's marked, that's easy. Otherwise, look at the statement of work, the section I contract clauses, section J attachments, see if there's anything in there that identifies what's going to be covered CDI. When in doubt, ask the contracting officer for clarification. If you're saying, look, I'm not sure if this is CDI or not, can you let me know? At least you then have that correspondence uh, with them about it. Uh, resist flow down of the requirement to you if performance doesn't require access to CDI. We see this as, well, it's a required flow down to everyone, I'm flowing it all down, and it's really not. So if you know that your performance, you're providing a cost product, there's no technical data being exchanged, it's not an ITAR item, then you can push back on accepting the clause. A few updates on the Freedom of Information Act. In June of 2016, there was a FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. I talked about FOIA earlier. Uh, FOIA can be used both as a sword and a shield. So you can go out and uh, as a shield, you want to make sure certain your information doesn't get out to the public, but some people forget that you could use it as a sword. Feel free to submit a FOIA request and ask for information about your competitors, see what you get. Um, so there's a, a push to promote greater transparency and openness in government. This always goes back and forth depending on who's in leadership. Do you want more openness? Do you want less openness? Right now, uh, in 2016, under Obama, there was more openness. There was a new rule of three that if an agency gets a request for the same set of documents or uh, three or more times, then they need to then just make it publicly available. Also, uh, typically the government has 30 business days to respond to a FOIA request. And um, if they timely notify you that, hey, we need a little bit more time, then they get an extra 10-day extension. If they don't give it to you in those 10 days, then you don't have to pay for the copying charges. But there is an exception if there's more than 5,000 pages. So, um, and, you know, as more openness is out there, not only can you submit more FOIA requests, just make sure you're properly marking the documents you send to the government. Put a FOIA exemption for marking on it. Gift-giving restrictions, um, as I mentioned, it's important to make sure that your company policies match up with government requirements. 
In November 2016, the Office of Government Ethics issued a final rule that revised portions of their gift giving requirements. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but there's a lot of detail on these slides. Um, some of the exceptions as to what is a gift or not, well, what if you're married to someone in the government? Is that a problem? Can you not give them a birthday gift? Well, no. Um, personal relationships and friendships, those are exempted, but it has to be real. So just because you're Facebook friends does not make you social friends, is what it said. Um, greeting cards and items with little intrinsic value intended primarily for presentations. You give someone a plaque, certificate, okay. But just because you um, engrave your company name on the iPhone doesn't make it like a, a giveaway with little intrinsic value. It has its own value, so that's not something you can give them. Modest item of food or drink or non-alcoholic refreshments um, are okay, other than as part of a meal. Um, so there are some, if you have an event that they're going to like a gala and there's alcohol, there are some exceptions on when you can give them alcohol. You don't have to say, hey, if you're with the government, you're not allowed to drink at this event. But um, at least for the food or refreshment exemption, alcoholic beverages don't um, count or you can't include it. Um, so we still have the 2050 rule that it's a $20 gift from an individual uh, or a company to a specific government employee. You can do it. It has to be less than $20 on any occasion and the max of $50 cumulatively over a given year. So that doesn't mean that I can give you $20 and Frank can give you $20 and Anna and Mika and Brandy. Um, no, that actually, we're all from Foley, so that $50 max is going to cap out there. Now, there's some restrictions on when the government should consider declining permissible gifts and such um, and when they can attend gatherings. So, if you're holding events, inviting government employees, make sure you're reading these requirements and complying. The next, for those who have grant and cooperative agreements, in May of 2017, the OMB extended the deadline to comply with their De December 2013 super circular procurement standards. Um, they extended the deadline to December 26, 2017, which is still coming up. The super circular is the culmination of a lengthy process that began in 2011 to streamline grants and cooperative agreements across agencies. It consolidated and amended instructions that were previously in eight separate OMB circulars applicable to non-federal entities and consolidated into one. This just relates to the procurement standards. So this is when the um, grant or cooperative agreement holder is buying goods or services underneath its cooperative agreement, what procurement standards does it need to comply with. I have them listed on these next two slides but you need to have a procurement standard and compliance program in place by December 26 of 2017. We've seen a lot of changes in the employment related requirements. Um, in particular, we, there was a change in August 2017 to require, um, I'm sorry, there's a, not prior to August 2017, there was a requirement for your EEO and re reports to change. So there was component one data and component two data. Component 2 data was going to require employers with 100 or more employees to provide summary W-2 compensation and hours work data for all employees by gender and race or ethnicity. Um, so there was a summary pay data and aggregate hours work data that was this Component 2 data. Um, the government has now decided that the requirement to have that Component 2 as of August 2017 is currently stayed effective immediately. So right now, they, because they wanted contractors to implement that component two, they gave an extension from the typical September 30th deadline to March 31st of 2018. They're still keeping the March 31st, 2018 deadline, but you only need to submit the component one information that you previously submitted in prior years. There's also been an extension. September 30th is also, also usually your deadline for your VETS 4212 reports. Given the hurricanes, uh, the government said if you submit it by November 15th, 2017, they won't ding you. Um, you're not impacted the hurricane. I mean, they don't. They didn't limit the extension to that, but um, so basically, it could be read as an extension for everyone. And last, there was a, a lot of requirements in the EEO area that had contractors up in arms, and um, either by executive order, by court, those have been revoked or stayed. And so, um, if you see these clauses in your contracts, or you thought you had to flow them down, they actually are no longer applicable. So you can kind of take them off your radar for now. And that's it. So let's go to our next Q&A session. Feel free to ask about anything from the first half or the second half. Uh, we'll do about five minutes of Q&A. Um, uh, before I get there, let me do my last code. 
Um, okay, so this is the last code to put into the poll question on the screen and then press submit. It's nine R's and rabbit, zero five four. Again, nine R's and rabbit, zero five four. Nine R's and rabbit, zero five four. Although after Frank's, I think everyone wants to go golfing right now, right? Is some subliminal message called golf? Okay, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is for the NDAA 2000, fiscal year 2017 provisions I referenced, have they been incorporated in the FAR and whether contracting officers need a compliance till they are? The answer is no. Um, as you saw from, I think it was, um, I, re I don't remember whose presentation, sometimes some of these, or Anna's, some of the requirements of 2015 fiscal year NDAA still aren't implemented. And now we have the, for every regulation issued, you have to take two away. How is that going to go? So um, the answer is no, and the answer is um, it's the law, but the contracting officers typically don't need to strictly comply with it until it's become part of the FAR that said that would not stop me as a contractor from citing to it in support of my position if I was making an argument to the contracting officer on a point. Go ahead. So the question is, under the DFAR Cybersecurity Clause, if you receive a contract act after October 2017, do you still submit information to the DOD CIO that you are not compliant with certain NIST requirements? Frank, do you know that one? I think you have to turn it on. For the specific terms of the clause that you're required to, I, I think it sort of falls into the, the realm of if you're, if you're, there is a requirement that if you're proposing an alternative security measure that you think is equivalent, that you have to get the DOD CIO approval. So if it's something like that, would still have that requirement. But in terms of the specific requirement that contracts awarded up to that date have that notification to the DOD CIO, I don't think that continues past that point. Um, but that's where you get into the system security plan, where you theoretically have to communicate to the contracting officer if you're not compliant with certain provisions, because otherwise there's sort of an implicit uh, representation that you are compliant with all the NIST standards. So I don't think you have to go to the DOD CIO, but I think you have to have some sort of uh, record, uh, hopefully your system security plan under the NIST, but some sort of um, record with, this, with the contracting officer that here's where we are, here's what we're still working to get compliant with, uh, just so that you're not held to later have implicit 